Okay. So uh, I'm Rudy Alhuri, Dean of the School of Architecture at the University of Miami. Thank you for joining us today for the next installment, the second one in our Technoglass lecture series uh, this academic year. I'd like to take an opportunity here to thank our generous sponsors, Technoglass, who have been actually supporting us for six years now enabling us to sustain this very ambitious programming for our series. So obviously this year we go online using the Zoom platform because of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, so we lose the live event that we all love so much. But uh, on the other hand, we gain was the possibility of actually having a global reach and we did our best actually to, to, to enlist speakers from all over the world. And uh, Jaime is gonna tell you uh, a bit more about the series uh, later when he introduces our esteemed speaker for today. But let me also uh, remind you that uh, we have another series. It's the current series, which actually runs usually on Mondays and it kicks off uh, on um, Monday, just checking here, uh, October 26th with Don Ruggles at 6 p.m. who's gonna talk about uh, neuroscience and aesthetics, a very fascinating topic on which he has actually published a book. So again, welcome. And uh, I turn now to my colleague, Professor Jaime Correa. So thank you for joining us. I'm Jaime Correa. I'm an associate professor in practice at the School of Architecture and the coordinator of this lecture series. On behalf of the School of Architecture of the University of Miami and Technoglass, I would like to welcome you, as well as Mr. Kunle at the EME. But before we start, let me remind you to keep your microphones off at all times. This will facilitate the deliverance of the lecture without unnecessary interruptions. Again, please keep all your microphones off at all times. At the end of this lecture, we will have a panel discussion led by distinguished professors Adib Kure and Victor Dupi, whose new book on the life and work of Emilio Sanchez was released recently. So if you have any questions or if you need any type of clarification, please use the chat box on the right hand side of your screen and the panelists will ask questions on your behalf. Today, we are honored to host Kunle Adeyemi for the second time in the School of Architecture. Mr. Kunle Adeyemi is the founder and principal of NLA, an architecture, design, and urbanism practice founded in 2010 with offices in Lagos and Amsterdam. Mr. Adeyemi's most famous piece of architecture is called the Makoko Floating School, floating structure located on the heart of the lagoon of Lagos, Nigeria. This prototype was also exhibited at the Biennale di Architettura in Venezia, where he won the famous Silver Lion Award of 2016. This prototype eventually became the Makoko Floating System, a prefabricated system of floating buildings now implemented in about five countries across three continents. This acclaimed project is part of his vision of what he calls African water cities. This is part of a research project which is exploring the intersections between rapid urbanization and climate change. Other NLA projects include the Shed in New York City, the Black Rhino Academy in Karatu, Tanzania, and the Serpentine Summer House at the Royal Kensington Gardens in London. Before founding NLA, Adeyemi worked with Rem Koolhaas at the Office for Metropolitan Architecture, OMA. He also holds an honorary doctorate degree in architecture from Hasselt University in Belgium, 
and a certificate in real estate economics and finance from the London School of Economics. He is now an adjunct visiting professor at the University of Lagos. He has been the 2017 Aga Khan design critic in architecture at, the, uh, at Harvard University and a professor at University of Washington, Columbia, Cornell, and Princeton University. His academic interest resides in the development of cities of the global south. He has developed this issue via a number of research papers and study opportunities, including a research project with Peter Eisenman and his published hypothesis called Urban Crawl in Log Journal, L-O-G. Adejemi is also one of the most important African influencers. He's been a juror at the Royal Institute of British Architects International Prize, the AIA Awards, the Venice Biennale, and the Rolex Mentor and Protege Program. As you can see, Mr. Adejemi uh, bridges critical gaps in infrastructure and urban development and creates coherent networks and global exchanges that work for real people. He's committed to transform the lives of millions of people via design, architecture, urbanism, development, economics, and finance. The scope of his practice, as you see, is not just limited to architecture. He basically explores all those social and cultural possibilities that contribute to great urbanism. As he said in 2010, although qualitatively different from place to place, the responsibility of achieving basic needs with minimum means remains the same globally. By now, it should be clear, clear that we indeed will be in the presence of an individual who is constantly inspired by the intelligence of those everyday solutions that can only be discovered via aggressive observation of everyday life in developing cities. On behalf of the School of Architecture, and Technoglass, please let's welcome Kunle Adeyemi. Thank you so much, Jamie, for that uh, incredible introduction. I, I am very flattered by, by uh, your portrayal of, of, uh, of uh, my, my work. Uh, <laughs> and, and, um, uh, and I'm really grateful for being back here again, um, uh, although virtually, uh, I think it's it's my visits a few years ago was really momentous, and um, I think what makes it interesting is that I'm I would have the opportunity to share development since uh, that time, um, which really is the fundamental uh, basis of this lecture, just to show you progress, uh, and I will go a little bit back to describe things that I think some of the students uh, who are here today may have missed in the last, uh, the last time I, I gave a lecture at the university. So some of it may be a little bit repetitive, but um, do uh, see it as um, a, a, you know, another step in a long-term uh, development of a body of work that I believe is just a lifetime of, uh, of work. And I would like to, uh, to thank uh, Technoglass again for supporting such an initiative uh, to allow uh, people like myself to um, be a part of this um, uh, uh, group. So I will share my screen. Let's see, I think I need, yeah, I need to have, so yeah, I need to have it. Okay, there you go. Right, Tell, let me know when you see the screen. Yeah, okay, I think that's good. All right, so um, before I actually start, I, I also wanna you know, put this in uh, the context of uh, the sort of global uh, situations. Uh, we know uh, after COVID uh, and you know, the, the, the world is in, 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 a, in a strange situation. I mean, we're in, a, in strange times and um, it, it will, I would not be doing this lecture justice if I do not 
um, uh, discuss uh, one of the challenges that we're even de de dealing with right now in Nigeria, uh, where there's a huge uh, challenge of, I mean, there's literally an uprising of the youth against uh, um, police brutality, and I think generally against injustice, and there's been killings and, and violence and, uh, and uh, uproar. And I think, you know, we ultimately um, want to stand for something. Everyone in, in the world wants to stand for some degree of equality, uh, justice, and uh, to ensure that uh, people uh, live, you know, comfortable lives and that they have very basic things to, to get by and, and think. Um, so, uh, and, you know, I would like lo love to then uh, um, just give uh, a moment of, of um, silence to some people that have passed away in this killing literally like a, a day ago in, in, in Lagos, in Nigeria. So um, thank you again for having me. My uh, office in Lay means at home uh, because we believe the home is a fundamental building block of any society. And uh, generally speaking, we stand for diversity and coexistence of humanity and the environment. Uh, and we do that by innovating um, cities and communities. That's our aim through architecture, design, and, uh, and urbanism. And um, we've, you know, we've done, we do work in these different fields, uh, architecture, urbanism, uh, through research. And some of that is expressed in uh, cultural projects that are also sort of art related. Um, there's a whole general body of work that cuts across different scales and um, pr project sizes uh, from furniture all the way to um, large uh, city planning. And as uh, Jamie uh, introduced, I've, I've had the opportunity to work at the Office of Metropolitan Architecture with REM for several years, where I um, you know, did a lot of large scale projects. And at, uh, about 10 years ago, it, you know, it, my desire to work within um, you know, areas that were more challenging, uh, the Global South uh, um, led me to, um, you know, move out on my own to start uh, a, a practice that focuses on these issues. Now we still, we work across the continent. We work in, you know, we work in four continents right now. And, uh, and it's not so much, but the, the learnings that we get from uh, areas and regions of where there's where there are challenges and uh, trying to develop ways and methodologies of working and thinking that would allow us to reapply those learnings into even areas of uh, uh, with advanced uh, um, or industrialized uh, uh, built environments is something that is very very key to our practice um, one of the pro projects that we've worked on uh, recently is the Black Rhino Academy, which is in, uh, in the very, very remote area of Tanzania, in Karatu, uh, Karatu in Tanzania. It's literally on the way to Ngorogoro crater, the Serengeti. And there's like, it's in a village that has just one main tarred road that cuts through it. So if you're going in to see um, to, to the Serengeti region or the Ngorogoro crater, you'll probably pass through this small village where we've been able to build um, a school uh, using local materials, very simple means, and uh, giving it a certain character uh, that is also derived from a very simple instruction, like we just asked the uh, builders to hang a, a loose, a, a heavy chain, and to create these archways uh, that would you know, provide sort of covered ways. So all the arches can be completely different in size and shape, but they are all, um, you know, based on a catenary, you know, just a, a very simple logical system. So which means that even the instructions for how to uh, build and how to um, uh, do the construction is just codified in a very simple, inherent, um, intuitive logic. Um, we also 
did some work in, um, the, in New York, uh, Prelude to the Shed, a couple of years ago, uh, which was a building um, by, uh, for the Shed, the new cultural institution, uh, which it was li literally to sort of launch the, uh, the, the Shed's culture. And we designed this building. You can probably find it on our website, NL, uh, nleworks.com, uh, on our, our um, Instagram page or anything. Um, uh, the, some more images of this project where the walls of the building um, is made of chairs and these walls can be moved around uh, manually to reconfigure them from a complete public space into an enclosed space, uh, a blackout, a black box. And we collaborated with uh, Tino Segal and several artists to produce uh, this space. Um, also uh, sort of in the, at the heart of our work is uh, a project called Chikoko Radio, I just got, yeah. um, which is a sort of an amphibious structure that straddles water and land. It's not a built structure yet, but it's one of the, um, let's say transitional projects that uh, begins to show our interest in building relationships between people and the built environment and particularly water, uh, where this structure is both a communal space, a jetty, a recording, uh, a, a, um, a radio station, a, you know, a market, and it's sort of a multidisciplinary, multifunctional space um, for the community. Um, and so this goes to uh, the one of the most, uh, you know, which has uh, um, a body of work that has become very important in our in, in our practice, which is water cities, looking at the relationships between cities and water. And I'll tell you a bit more about that, but just the, I, the, the notion that we must learn to uh, bring water closer to our uh, urban fabrics. And instead of constantly fighting water, we should learn to live with it. Um, and that you know, there are examples and precedents of cities that are doing this a lot better, whether um, it is just the, the way they are designed from high-rise buildings in Chicago with, you know, lots of waterways uh, to, uh, as you move sort of out of the perimeter, you have, you know, lower density buildings um, like Amsterdam or some on stilts or like Venice. And as you go further out, you can begin to uh, be a lot more uh, free uh, with the kind of structures that live on water, you know, with, with a lot less uh, footprints in, in, in a way. And uh, these could become uh, floating structures or structures on stilts, and they could accommodate different various kinds of uh, living conditions and recreational conditions from, uh, you know, play areas to housing to uh, you know, to, to pools, to uh, agriculture, et cetera, et cetera. And generally to develop a vision that is really for nature-based solutions uh, and smart res resilient cities that uh, address the challenges of climate change uh, and uh, really looking at adaptation, way, ways of creating adaptation measures for dealing with these uh, changes in the environment. Uh, but also that they are um, solutions that leave no one behind. They are inclusive and allow um, different levels and social classes and different, let's say, uh, uh, bi a biodiverse uh, um, uh, group of people with different kinds of uh, occupational uh, interests. Uh, why is that important? Why is that important? It's, it is because we realize through research in the last nine years that, um, of course, we know that two of our most important challenges of our time uh, is uh, our urbanization uh, on one hand, just the growth of people and the pressure of living in environments and, you know, things, the challenges that we're having of, for inequality and even issues of Lagos in Lagos can be tied to the ch challenges of urbanization where cities are growing large and growing huge. I mean, Lagos is the largest city uh, in Africa, and Africa is the second most urbanizing 
uh, continent in, in the world. So in a way, Lagos is the epicenter of Africa, African urbanization. And the current um, chaos, uh, uh, which is tagged under the name NSARS and the police brutality could also be linked to the challenges of just uh, growth and urbanization amongst many other things uh, under that category. And within that is just the challenge of the environment, this climate change. And um, 80, it's, it's, we know that 80% of the world major cities and capitals are actually by waterfronts with nearly 50% of human population right next now living in those cities and around water bodies all over the world. And uh, most of those, that growth is seen in, um, in many Asian and African uh, uh, cities on, the, on those continents. And of course, the, this is no surprise that we have most of our cities along those uh, waterways because the cradle of civilization and in a way, the human um, history is literally uh, founded upon uh, water and, the, and waterways because of the need for agriculture, um, in the fertile crescents in Mesopotamia, uh, transportation, uh, you know, security, uh, and so many other things, of course, just water is, is life, you know, water is the, is a, is, is the basis of, of life. Um, but we now see, of course, that the development and the challenges of uh, building in um, building cities and building it, them in ways that are not uh, particularly in, um, uh, you know, not working with the, the forces of the environment and the implications of our own kind of humanity are becoming very, very, um, uh, you know, are in, in conflict with, with the built, with, um, the, with nature. And perhaps uh, also just the, the effect of our existence on the planet is becoming um, challenging uh, in ways that are very uh, threatening to the, the exact fabric that we create ourselves. So this is a view of, of uh, Manhattan after Superstorm Sandy in 2012, where half of it is shut down uh, after the storm. Uh, and most of it is uh, flooded. The evidence of this kind of uh, challenges are all over the world now with hurricanes, uh, typhoons, cyclones, floods, monsoons, heavy monsoons, rainfalls. And, you know, this is just a prevalent uh, thing. And uh, of course, we, you know, being in Miami, this is uh, no news to. Um, to you, I, I'm, I'm probably, uh, uh, you know, I'll be, I'll be preaching to the gospel if I'll be telling you about flooding and the challenges of climate change in uh, cities like that. Uh, and this is an image that is portraying, you know, a city that um, is in a way um, flooded where some of the towers uh, you can see still sticking out and some of the houses are so, uh, uh, submerged. Now, this is not a, I mean, it seems slightly dystopic um, view of its cities. Uh, at the same time, I immediately look at this and I think to myself, you know, we need to think about our cities and take on this sort of conditions and how do we live? How could we live in conditions like this? Now, this image in some ways uh, uh, is not very different from the one I started out with where um, the fabric of the city is largely uh, covered by water. Now, if, this, if we were to think about a city like this, how would we be dealing with this uh, situation? Uh, we know that is not, um, that, that is something that is, is happening already because obviously the culture of uh, cultivating land um, in sort of human history has just grown so much that we, that land has become overrated. We constantly, you know, part of our ways of expanding our territory as a human um, civilization is to uh, do land reclamation and, you know, basically change the, morpholo the morphology of and topography and, and, you know, just the, of, of, uh, of, the, um, of the built environment. And 
that has implications that we have not been able to sort of evaluate properly. Um, but we know that it leads to uh, impacts of, uh, with, with um, you know, ecological degradation, uh, environmental issues, but also just the, the capital investments that is required to build these kinds of um, places, whether it's in Dubai, or, you know, they, they are so high that they become un unattainable and inaccessible for the average person. So what is interesting is that we then also have seen that there, there is what you could call a rising water population. A, a group of people, a, you know, a civilization that are still living or have learned to settle on land, on water uh, bodies that's, you know, uh, they are taking advantage of, let's say, the, the water body for agriculture, for transportation, the very basic needs that we've always had as a human species and a human civilization. In a way, we now understand that, you know, land being overrated, uh, water for us is, let's say, the uh, new asset. And why do we keep fighting water when we can actually learn to live with it? Uh, they, and we've seen evidence of people who are doing this. So these settlements are all over, uh, they're different in different parts of the world. Mainly, like I mentioned, we've seen them also in these two continents that are expanding quickly and also being affected by climate change. Uh, that is Asia and Africa. So there are lots of these settlements scattered all around. Uh, we know there are some also in the, in, in, you know, in the, the Americas, we know they're in South America, North America. We know there are some in Europe. Uh, there's, you know, there are settlements you know, from Seattle to uh, San Francisco. They, you know, there are lots of communities that are learning to live with water. Uh, but we see a lot of that happening in, in Asia and Africa, where even in Asia, they are already building much more organized developments with thousands of houses in the Philippines, Brunei, Venezuela, you know, um, uh, um, Thailand, uh, etc. And... Um, and, and that although Africa is said to be the least responsible for climate change, just in terms of its contribution to you know, greenhouse uh, gas emissions and all of that, but it is said to be the one, one of the most affected by it with areas of it within high and extreme high risk zones. So you then kind of get a, a situation like this where um, with very, minimal um, infrastructure, the people uh, are really affected by it, with people sort of trying to get out of the situation and others trying to deal with it uh, and roads and you know basic places are always flooded. Uh, but we've also seen people adapting to this uh, condition uh, and they are really taking the opportunity to innovate and their resilience is showing you know, is, is really like they know they're dealing with this environment and not through uh, high technology, but with very basic things. So these guys may have found this scrap uh, boat and, you know, they're just using logs of wood to or, or, or metal poles to just navigate. And uh, they almost look like they're having a great time already. So this image is really for us sort of the, um, the core of our practice where we believe that uh, with within challenging environments, there are uh, opportunities, and there's you know ways of there's there's a lot of collective intelligence and um, and innovation that we can learn from. And in 2011, we began the African Water Cities Project, where uh, we identified 20 African cities that are both affected by climate change and. Uh, uh, and rapid urbanization and growth. And we started looking at the intersections of these two conditions in the African, uh, con on the African continent. And, uh, and we began researching every year with one institution, uh, we, uh, or, uh, you know, where I took students from, um, uh, you know, from the various institutions to these cities and they would research the city, find challenges around these two issues and develop uh, their own sort of responses to it. Um, so we looked at projects in Abidjan, Lagos, Dar es Salaam, Rwanda, and Durban with uh, various institutions and also Cape Verde. Um, 
and uh, in, in uh, like I mentioned in Africa, there are lots of these settlements all sort of scattered in a way. They, they are sort of reminisce, they, they're reminiscent of, of, you know, what I would describe as the DNA of cities. Like this is really, in a way, that's sort of very, very, uh, the heart and the birth of how cities are formed, whether it is the need for agriculture or just the lack of uh, the capacity to um, cultivate land as you know, you know, as a as real estate, or the access to uh, um, or ac access to um, farming or or agriculture or or fishing. You know, there's something about just settling by water in a very, very basic way that we think um, are insightful for learning how to re-imagine uh, ourselves um, as, as a different, um, as, as a civilization that uh, perhaps uh, in the near future, the, um, we, we feel the, the, uh, the future of human civilization may become more aquatic and that these are all already insights to how we should rethink our existence there. So while all of this is happening indeed, we still think that many African and Asian cities are, are, are still quite underprepared uh, with a lot of challenges in housing, infrastructure, quality, uh, uh, public facilities and sanitation. So there's a whole gamut of um, challenges that need to be tackled and I think we, we, we began looking at these things uh, from our perspective where we can contribute. And the goal is that hopefully we can learn to think differently, uh, to build differently, and hopefully to create ways of living uh, differently in, in, that, uh, in, a way, in ways that would be more sustainable and adapted to our changing environment. The, um, the center of that thought and that challenge and that body of work uh, it was situated in a community called Makoko in Lagos. Um, and in a way, Makoko represents, um, is, a, is a community with, uh, said to be with uh, maybe about 80 to 100,000 people that live on water. So what you see in this image is just people who have built um, homes over many years on water. And it's um, technically de defined as a slum. Uh, where you know there's very little, uh, uh, you know, very little resource infrastructure, land. Um, you know, most people just live with very very scarce resources, and this is like a typical home in Makoko, where you know it's on first sight it appears like this is just un un unlivable, but this is also a place where uh, you know this gentleman with his family. Uh, actually have a thriving uh, life where you know they have a place to live a place to sleep a place to uh, cook you know uh, and even though the sanitation conditions are really bad for for me uh, it was not just the challenge that we that we saw but also the opportunities and the fact that a, a, a man like this who built this structure with very very scarce resources um, there must be something to learn from him. And that's what inspired uh, the projects that uh, we began, the Makoko Floating School, uh, many years ago, uh, now uh, almost nine years ago in 2011, when I was researching affordable housing. And it occurred to me that if I was thinking about looking, if I was trying to solve affordable housing, uh, I need to understand who people that live in the cheapest dwellings and a home like this is one of the cheapest dwellings in the city in, in Lagos because they're not paying for land. They're using mostly like re, you know, lightweight materials, recycled. Uh, they have found ways of sort of dealing with the environment. And yes, it's not ideal, but if we could make improvements in this system and find the challenges and solve the problems that they have, perhaps we might have um, a lead to a possible uh, building solution. So one of the ways that we've learned to um, analyze the urban dynamics that really affects development is 
uh, through what we call the seven decima factors. Uh, and the seven decimal factors are really um, not about design. We don't approach a project by with our overarching interests to simply design, but we look at it by breaking it down into these seven registers where we try to understand the, the dynamics that really influence that project um, and the need to intervene um, and the, com the complex conditions around it. And those factors are uh, demographics, uh, the um, economics of this, the environment, um, social politics, uh, infrastructure, morphology, uh, uh, the environment itself, and the resources. Now, of course, this really decima is, really is a breakdown of the two issues that we are, that we really stand for: issues of humanity, so demographics, money, social politics. You know, these are things about human life, and infrastructure is sort of a bridge between that and the environment, which is indeed represented through the morphology, shape, and nature of the land or water or the topography. Uh, and the resources that supports um, that, uh, that you can get from those environments. Um, so this then takes us straight into the pilot project, which we started out with uh, when we began that research, Makoko Floating School that has now become uh, Makoko Floating System. And Makoko Floating System is really a simple way to build on water. And um, we, we learned that because we saw the we saw the community of Makoko building simply on water. Now their solution is not all um, safe or or or, or, wet or uh, flood proof or etc. You know, and it's not up to standard. You know, in terms of just building systems and and code for safety and how to you know live in an environment. So there's room for improvement. Um, and of course, they need, they, they have scarce resources, is why they build so cheaply. But the difference between what they build and what is standard in most parts of the world is, is a huge, is a huge gap. And there, there are so many opportunities to improve it along the way and create something that, that still works uh, for them, but uh, also for the general public. And one of the main challenges of Makoko is, of course, that they build on stilts, as you'd see in the houses in the background here. Uh, and that means that with the rising tidal conditions in even Makoko, a community like Makoko is still prone to flooding. So we decided to create simple flotation device uh, that allows um, a, a platform, whatever kind of platform that they would be on, to adapt to the tidal change. And this was a very simple um, strapped with you know, plastic barrels, which we found locally and uh, also inspired. Actually, while I was looking for flotation device, I saw these kids on this, um, you know, this re you know, just abandoned, uh, um, it's, you know, it's, it's used for sort of pipes, for uh, oil pipes or you know, in water and they just use it for a boat. So we, we, we got plastic barrels from the community and made this uh, first flotation device. And uh, working with the community, learning from them, kind of understanding how they build, the type of materials they use, why they last, you know, we created this uh, structure, uh, Makoko Floating School, um, which is this uh, 10 meter by 10 meter platform uh, that sits on 256 barrels and it's on three floors, uh, but it's, and it's a triangle. Uh, and that, the, the idea of a triangle came to me at a point at a time when I spoke with one of a naval architects, actually a, a houseboat builder, one of the largest houseboat builders in, in the Netherlands. And he said, you know, for flotation generally, you know, for balance and stability, the width bottom should be roughly, uh, it should not be, uh, smaller than height, you know, and then, um, of course, a triangle has stability in terms of uh, the low center of gravity. Uh, and so that led to the development of what 
uh, became Makoko Floating School, uh, which was indeed kind of a minimum viable product at the time. Um, and it's not really a structure that uh, was perfect. It was not perfect. It was, we built it at a time where the community was being forcefully evicted by Lagos state government at the time they thought, well, you know, they're growing too large and too dangerous and, you know, people should not be living on water in that way. And we intervened with this structure to say, well, why don't you think about it differently? Why don't you look at the opportunities for um, making them live in, in a way that uh, is uh, more in line with their lifestyle as opposed to forcing them to move to land. So it wasn't a structure that was perfect, but it was something that in a way started making everything around it a, a little more uh, perfect and organizing co you know, the community and making it a, 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 an important uh, center point in there. So I know a lot of people um, remember very strongly Makoko Floating School as a, as a building, uh, as a school, but it was really a prototype um, that we developed um, as a building system. And we've always said that from the, the, from the get go. Um, and that it was something that was designed as a catalyst to stimulate thinking in the environment. Uh, it was very much about innovation, uh, about adaptation to climate change. And it was also very much about education. So Makoko Floating School in a way, it's not just about a school in a physical sense, but really, in it, the, 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 the building and the structure itself is about education. The school to educate us, to educate community, to educate the world about the um, impact of climate change, the impact of, of the, the opportunities for adaptation, and to sort of uh, start a movement of how to respond to this in areas where we need to also think about inclusivity, um, um, and and just you know local resources where they're scarce uh, where they're scarcity. The main structure com is composed of uh, three elements: wood, uh, steel connections, and a uh, flotation device. And the flotation device, you know, seen in you know, can be just uh, plastic barrels uh, or can range into different things like uh, uh, EPS uh, boxes or even uh, concrete. But we've always, one thing we've always wanted to do was to keep the system so simple that it can be fabricated locally and hopefully at a scale that is human, that you don't need uh, a lot of heavy equipment. Uh, this is just a video of the first experience working with the community, the guy teaching me, telling me about the wood and building the first uh, uh, platform uh, and you know, kids jumping on it and already having a great time uh, us launching several platforms and tying, putting them together. Uh, this is, you know, how this, you know, it was all being cut and having a great time while they're also building. Um, and, and the community just being part of it, con constantly educating us and telling us, you know, how to, uh, you know, make improvements, changes. And even before it was completed, it was already sort of a public space that was highly utilized yeah, you know and it was always a space of for uh, experimentation thinking you know different systems looking at solutions um so it was a place that was really you know this center uh, in the community as you'd see the rest of the community that gave them some you know security and 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 identity and brought put them even much more on the map uh, in a way that made uh, the demolition of the community even more uh, uh, complex uh, at the time. And I, I would say uh, really uh, helped in uh, supporting their being there. And like I said, it was not just about a school. You know, I know, you know, the, the sentiments of a school and, um, you know, the number of students that it would accommodate is very important. But this was really about a, a much larger vision of um, climate change adaptation, uh, which is also, which was supported by the UNDP and the Federal Ministry of the Environment. And we've always thought about this as a prototype that can be adapted for different uses, not just the school, but really to educate us and educate uh, the, the, the continents on how to develop 
homegrown solutions for uh, uh, climate change. Um, so you have pictures of, we have pictures of its use in different forms, uh, impact it had, uh, you know, education, employment, local economy, uh, you know, and how it's, and its recognition for its uh, uh, contribution to the discourse of climate change and floating architecture um, and the catalyst that enabled many people and, and I would imagine some of the other students or some of you students to also think about your own solution because this is just one of many ways of uh, building something. Um, and uh, in 2016, it was uh, it, after three years of use, uh, it was not properly managed, of course, because this was also a bit of a learning, uh, quite a lot of learning point for not only us, but the community itself. In, and this was the first structure that they you know, the main public space. And there was a lot of sort of mismanagement and deterioration and um, which led to its, um, its collapse. Uh, but it was, it, was, it was not really out of a, um, it wasn't as it was, as it's been reported in some media that it's really about the storm, et cetera. It's, it's not really about that. It was just that, you know, it had, it had, um, yeah, it had uh, served its purpose. And in a way, we were ready to, we knew that it was damaged and it wasn't repaired properly. We had conversations with community. And because it's innovation, it's okay for some failures and we learn from failures. Uh, and, you know, even in, in, in any kind of innovation, if you don't actually um, fail within sort of very controlled environments, you, you, you probably don't have the best value for it. So sometimes you even need to test uh, a, a, a system to destruction to ensure that you understand its um, full uh, capacities and potential. And that's what we did. And uh, there were no casualties in, in the at the time it came down. It had been uh, set aside and it was ready to be uh, demolished. Uh, so because we were already building the one in Venice, which was our second prototype, MFS2, uh, where we built it and turned it into a much more prefabricated system and launched it at the Venice International Biennale, uh, where we were fortunate to win the Silver Lion for this. Uh, but we turned it into a complete building system uh, and continued to improve all in the areas where there were deficiencies that we had learned in the first one. And in 2018, we got the opportunity to build the second or third version, which is MFS3. Uh, uh, in Bruges for the city of Belgium, where as you'd see the system even became a lot more modular, uh, where all the kind of parts were reduced. So imagine we started with like 300 uh, unique components. We began um, making them more modular and, uh, and standardized for easier production and reducing that number to, you know, 150, 20, you know, coming close, lower and lower, just for easier fabrication. And it became something that could be flat packed, uh, designed to Euro codes. So it means that it would be usable in different parts of the world. Um, and you see the connections a lot more uh, um, robust with, you know, bolted joints. That means you can also disassemble them. Uh, it was used for a school um, program by students uh, in the community where they also started uh, developing their own kind of uh, floating uh, building towers and uh, more ambitious than we are, thank goodness. And, uh, and um, in the same year, we also got the opportunity to build MFS 3x3, um, the fourth prototype in China. Now, um, this was an opportunity to do a, a, an exhibition space um, for uh, Central Pompidou in Paris and a local art foundation called Mao Jihong Foundation for an exhibition called Cosmopolis. And we then took that opportunity to, you know, look at how we could uh, replicate the system, but also to scale it up. And, you know, what better place could you, could one learn to, um, mass produce and scale up um, production of anything than in China. 
So what we did was we looked at that modular system and we downsized it and just multiplied it into three modular st structures uh, where the original being a three floor structure uh, was now reduced using the same kind of sort of um, structural system to a two floor structure and a one floor structure uh, producing a small, uh, medium, and a large, uh, uh, um, three large, three vessels all sort of tethered around a central triangular plaza. In a way, turning this into some sort of, you know, a community of uh, houses that could be used in, for different purposes. And we know that small is about 25 square meters or 250 square feet. Um, could be ideal for like a, a, a single room. The second is about 90 square meters. I think that's about 900 square feet, which would be ideal for a two bedroom on two floors. And the third could be used as a hall. It's, it's, it's three floors or it could be used as a, on three on, on a, for a four bedroom house on office space. So there's, you know, the use and the, the, um, the flexibility and uh, the versatility of the system it's become started becoming more apparent, uh, particularly with even this sort of central communal plaza, where you know you could use it for different purposes. So indeed, you know it's versatile. It comes in different sizes and different uh, floor number of floors, and it can be used in rural and urban areas. We also know um, that we can use it. We can lay it out for housing, that single or multi uh, housing units. And that you know the system is such that you can uh, build it with local resource materials and recycle it at the end of its life, or really just uh, you know extend the life. Now it's it says 25 year design life. It's actually 30, 30 years that needs to be corrected, but that's only to the extent that it is um, for the design life. I mean, if it's managed and maintained, there's nothing wood can be used uh, can can last for several hundred years. Um, so uh, that's been a sort of journey in the last uh, uh, um, seven, eight years. Uh, and uh, just this year or sometime last year, we got the opportunity to uh, then build our most ambitious version of the structure, which is uh, prototype five called MFS4, which we built in Mindelo. Uh, Cape Verde, you may not know, uh, Cape Verde is an is an archipelago of islands in the in West Africa, and um, you know it's got ten islands, and each of you know it's ninety nine percent covered by water, and it's beautiful, uh, you know, beautiful environment. The landscape is gorgeous. It has you know it sits. It's you know historically it's the first um, uh, first European settlement in Africa where it was used. It was a it was basically a trading post where most of the where many slave and enslaved people were taken from uh, West Africa and held captive there before they were shipped to you know, the Americas uh, in the transatlantic slave trade uh, sort of um, period of over 400 years. So in a way, it was sort of the, uh, um, the point of no return um, at the time and where you, know, you knew when you got to Cape Verde, you were really going to leave. And we, we see this, I mean, that produced in a way, of course, its challenges and historical uh, problems, but also a, a, a place with a diverse culture and people and, and environments. Uh, so it's, you know, it's a blend of European, uh, American, uh, you know, African roots and, and, you know, this sort of diverse culture where, of course, music has, become, has grown and is now thriving a lot. Because music was, of course, sort of the, one of the main binding agents between these different peoples that came, that were brought together, and you know, taken through these long uh, trips and uh, in the in slave uh, trade on the on the vessels on ships, and they you know they sang songs and the songs that they sang, the songs of freedom, were parts where the was really essential in in keeping them together and developing languages like Creole and this culture, you know, spreading all across South America and some parts of North America. And the concepts uh, for what we're, the project, the project that we're doing in Cape Verde 
uh, using MFS as a system is to look at the history of Cape Verde, the culture, and the fact that it's, it's, it's a city on water and um, creates a floating music hub that uh, somewhat acts, brings people together uh, to act as a vessel of return for people in the African diaspora and the African continent, like a melting point where they celebrate music, use music, culture, dance, art, film, fashion, the sort of creative industries to um, again, rewrite their own narrative, a space that where it's, you know, brings people, you know, um, they can celebrate these, the, the history, the unique history that they all, that they share. And uh, the large space, the large vessel is used as a music hall. Uh, the medium is used as a recording studio and the small is, uh, the small is used as a bar. And um, in a way to create this point of uh, return for talents in Africa and the African diaspora to celebrate uh, new culture and write their own narratives. So the, the structure has been, the construction started end of uh, December, or sometime in December, but this part of the structure was built in about three weeks, really all prefabricated. Cape Verde is a place where most uh, materials are imported anyway. So most of the elements were made in different places and we brought them and we just assembled them pretty much um, uh, in, in a few weeks. And the construction is uh, going on um, it's despite the, the break in the process uh, due to the COVID uh, lockdown and um, sits in this incredible landscape in the bay, which is in the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, again, uh, this is a little bit more ambitious for us because this is the first time we're building in the Atlantic in, in the marine environment, uh, which also has its own challenges and we're learning and improving. So this is again, work in progress, but it's one that allows us to build a very sort of a semi-permanent structure, which will be there for at least 15 years. Um, would also remain a learning point uh, sort of going forward. Um, I will uh, end uh, with a um, one minute video that uh, sort of captures our uh, learning and our uh, experience and our uh, journey in the last uh, eight years of, uh, of MFS. And um, I would, with that, uh, want to thank you. Thank you very much. So, Adib, you're on. Ule, great seeing you again. Hey, Adib. How are you? Thank you very much for your a great uh, presentation, a great lecture, very beautiful work. It's very nice to see the, as you said, the development of the work in the last few years from the time, last time you came to Miami. Uh, and uh, it's very remarkable and very impactful overall. So congratulations, actually. Uh, the question, I have a few questions to ask, a couple of questions. One is coming from a general summary of what is being asked in the panel by the audience. And one is a personal interest of mine that you've engaged, of course, directly in that it has to do very, very much uh, with, with something that interests us here at the School of Architecture at UM and personally myself uh, as a, from a pedagogical point of view, as well as from a, from a point of view of practice, 
And it has to do with the, the role of, the, of vernacular architecture and the influence of the vernacular in your work. Uh, here in Miami, at the School of Architecture, we've had a long-standing uh, awareness uh, uh, of the virtues of the vernacular, vernacular architecture, uh, in, in its kind of embedded intelligence, the, the logic of it, uh, uh, the kind of its very powerful relationship that it has with particular place and, and locality. Um, and I think I, that sensibility for the appreciation of the vernacular comes from the fact that here in Miami, arguably, we are we participate in this in the context of the Caribbean, of the Caribbean world, in this, which has a very rich vernacular tradition. Myself, I'm, I was born in Barranquilla and grew up in Barranquilla, and that world is also part of the Caribbean. And so that 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 has had a great deal to do with, I guess, our sensibility. So, and I think it's shared by many here in Miami that teach in Miami and practice in Miami. So my question to you would be: Could you, or I'm interested in knowing, in uh, a little bit more about. Uh, maybe your own experiences, your growing, growing up in, in Africa and your own childhood memories and experiences in Africa and whether those had uh, an, an impact in the way in which you engage this particular subject uh, and how maybe, had, maybe if it has at all uh, uh, helped you, let's say, think about how to not only design these individual buildings, but maybe how you ultimately be, think about the shaping of entire environments, not only locally within, let's say, Africa, but, in, but even abroad as they move from one place to another. Yeah, th thanks, uh, Adiba. I, I think it does. Um, you know, I, I, I was raised in, a, in, a, in the northern part of Nigeria. Um, you know, it's a sort of a suburb uh, where my dad was also an architect and his father was a, was a farmer. Um, and I, I grew up in a, in a house that was both a home, but also sort of a farm. We had animals and, 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 and plants and grew our own food. And, you know, uh, and my father would always experiment with, his, with, with the building um, and always sort of add to it. And, you know, it was always a sort of organic thing that kept growing. Uh, and we would always be, you know, this landscape itself was always inspiring. And I think that, in a way, uh, developing an eye for your immediate environment and what people are doing and, and just nature um, became an in, in important part of my way of thinking and, and being inspired. And, and so whether it is architecture in terms of its vernacular or just um, nature, uh, I think it always has an in influence on on my my uh, on my work, and and I think that's where ultimately my interest is in creating um, uh, you know um, spaces and infrastructure and, and environments that really bridge that relationship between humanity. And, and our, our, our built environment. So um, I think our vernacular architecture really just means every the every day or vernacular really just means for me every day uh, people, a language, you know, that's the average person has access to. And I think there's a lot of collective intelligence in, 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 in just being inspired by what people are already doing and finding looking at that as sources of um, innovation, just taking it to the next level. Yeah, it's a kind of celebration of the beauty of the ordinary in a way as well. Yes, yes, yeah, indeed, yeah. Uh, in, in a, so maybe a perhaps a, a connected to or related to this, to this topic of the vernacular and this intelligence that you find in, the, in, the, in this local, local expressions of building, uh, there a, a great deal of the comments that have been posted on, on our comment board here in the chat board have somehow, I think, relate to this topic. And uh, one of the comments, I was, one of the interests, I think, from the, from the audience is in knowing a bit more about uh, the systems that you're developing, uh, particularly for, this, for, the, for the school, and, um, and how, if you could expand a bit more on how, uh, how they are, they are structurally, let's say, uh, constructed, not only structurally constructed, but also how they relate to, let's say, the general climate, the wave action, for example, is a question that came up to, 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 
to the to this to these changes of the environment over the course of a year, let's say, uh, and, yeah. and how do you how do you react to that? How do you how do you yeah, answer that? Good question, and um, I think I think some of that question may have also been other questions by some passionate students and <laughs> in the uh, in the in on the call. Uh, I think you know no there's no there's no we've been we've been working on this for several years and we we always um, you know we are we always there's always room for learning and there's always room for improvements there's uh, we're not saying that what we've done is anywhere near perfect and any form of um, um, let's say criticism um, should we're always happy for it to be tabled and not necessarily expressed in, in, in some in any form of aggression. So uh, having said that, I think the you know the engineering um, starts from a very, very basic principle of, of um, um, you know the idea of flotation, right? And a body displaces uh, floats because it displaces the same amount of uh, uh, water that is equal to its weight, essentially, right? And and there's a whole kind of science and very simple basis to that. And you only just need to create enough volume for that displacement and the weight is always m measured. So once it's floating, it's one thing to float, but the other thing is to create stability and the shape informs some level of stability uh, inherently. Uh, and then the system is itself has an A-frame provides rigidity for structure, right? And we know an A-frame is always, it's very simple, but also provides an inherent way of building it without the need for going vertical and having a lot of need for scaffolding and things like that, because you can literally, so there's a lot of intelligence um, built into that. And it was engineered by, uh, our, the, re most, so the recent versions were engineered by ACOM, which is one of the largest engineering firms we worked with uh, Dijkstra, which is one of the most uh, renowned uh, uh, naval architects. They build super yachts and things. So, you know, we're not just, even though we started this on a somewhat of a, uh, you know, intuition and then, you know, we have enough of engineering and science behind it and, and technology behind it. And, you know, I, you know, as my, my experience and practice, I've done much more complex buildings, uh, uh, you know, towers and, and, you know, all over the world. So, um, but this is still interesting and challenging. And, and I'm not saying that we're off the hook on its uh, perfection, right? No, but um, when the, when Wilbur and Older Wright uh, um, made the first flights and, you know, you have no idea how many uh, accidents that they had and they crashed and people, their engineers died and, you know, we, we haven't even had, we're not you know, such casualties and we're making steps. And that is innovation, you know, it's that you understand um, it, improvements, you know the risks, you measure it and you manage it and you find situations to make it, uh, make improvements. And that's what we're doing. Mm. The structure is engineered now to uh, uh, 58 knots, uh, which is, uh, quite a high wind speed. Uh, we're building it in Mindelo, which is one of the windiest cities in the world. Uh, and that's, you know, 63 is hurricane, uh, uh, is already hurricane uh, wind speeds. And we can continue to improve the engineering depending on where we want to. A wave action is just, you know, it's just another form of sort of uh, movement on, on disturbing the stability. And once you, ha you have that, yeah, you you deal with you deal with the stability. You deal with the with the with the anchoring. You deal with the uh, loads that are being transferred, and and you know you understand those conditions. And uh, so, again, you know these are very technical questions, but they are also questions that we are constantly uh, tackling, and we're learning to deal with them and improve on them. And uh, it's, it's also very easy for people to raise uh, objections and, and have <laughs> concerns. But I, I think just you just start your own, just do it. Just get an idea and go out there and 
you know, and uh, yeah, do it. It's, it's easy to have, to do a nice rendering and make a, a have concept, conceptual ideas and, and uh, but it's not enough in today's world. That's not, that's just, that's not enough. You can't sit there and, and have ideas. You need to learn to bring your ideas to reality and, and take risks and, and fail and learn to fail again and improve on them. Absolutely. Excellent. Thank you very much. Kunle. I think uh, my colleague Victor has a few questions for you as well. Kunle, uh, thank you for your thoughtful and inspiring talk uh, and work, I should note. Um, I'm delighted to be part of this panel and, and um, get to share some ideas with you. Um, you mentioned the issue of sanitation. Right. And of course, um, when one looks at Makoko and one um, can just see the uh, challenging conditions there. But I, sh I ask uh, this question of sanitation because uh, Miami and, well, we can add Venice to that, uh, my, well, the Venetian Canal is already, as we know, a sewer. But Miami um, uh, could very well be facing uh, serious sanitation uh, conditions with uh, sea level rise and things like that. The, the author Jeff Goodell in his book, The Water Will Come, has painted, I don't know if you've read it, but he's painted a pretty dire portrait of uh, the toxic conditions of, of uh, sea level rise and the impact on that. So I wanted to ask you, um, what are some of the strategies that your group or in, through your research or teaching have um, considered uh, with respect to sanitation as part of the whole um, you know, big picture of living and uh, building on water. Yeah, thank you so much. I get asked the question quite a lot. And uh, as you imagine, it's one of the very basic things, right, that you, you think about. Now, what, I, what I, I think the fundamental points about this is that sanitation is not a challenge on, for water alone. It's also still a challenge on land. And one of the things that we're dealing with and one of the ways that we've learned to deal with that challenge is actually to dump our waste into water as opposed to really tackling it you know, from its source. It's only a few systems and a few solutions that are looking at sustainable ways of dealing with waste. So, um, so the, the first thing is that the problem is not just about water, that, oh, you know, because we're on water, you know, we have a unique way of dealing with it. No, the problem is our general behavior towards sanitation that is on land, and we've just decided to dump it in the water. Behavioral change, that has to change. Uh, that behavior has to change. Uh, we have to find more sustainable solutions. And if it works on land, it would work, it works on water. Now, there might be some peculiarities. You might have to you know, change some very basic systems. But there are systems that we know are best practice, whether for solid waste, for uh, bi bi um, biodegradable waste, whether it's biodigesters or, or just simply, you know, sorting your waste and having, you know, plastics and, 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 and paper and this and sorting them out and recycling them. I mean, it's one of the simplest things or not using materials. So the attitude towards waste management um, on land is still what we would be looking for on water. Now, there are very, very specific peculiarities to water. One would argue, that's okay, you know, uh, you don't, you don't, you know, you, you, you don't, uh, how do you pipe it? How do you, so you can have unitized systems, you can have stand, you know, uh, units that are completely self-sufficient, or you can have them also piped to a central sewage management system where it is either um, a, uh, you know, uh, some form of uh, organic waste treatment center or a septic uh, uh, treatment center. And the same question applies to, to uh, uh, water management. How do you get water? Um, now, I say this from a very broad perspective because um, we are not sanitation experts. And in, in, you know, in dealing with this question and in developing a solution, a holistic solution of living 
on water, and we're also doing pro projects on land. And we're asking the same questions. We, you know, we've just been commissioned to do some project in Zimbabwe where we're, you know, working with the, with the UN on solutions for toilets, even basic toilets. And it's still the same question. It's on land, it's not on water. And you still have to uh, find those solutions. So um, I, I think the, 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 the answer is that where we, we continue to look for uh, and work and collaborate with experts that have the knowledge, uh, have done their homework, and have done the research and have best practice solutions for dealing with these issues and integrate these solutions into our system. But moving on to water actually allows us this unique opportunity to rethink our, our you know, the way we look at water. It's, not, it's no longer a dumping ground. If we begin to inhabit that body of water, hopefully we'll give it a little more respect and know that we should not be dumping our waste into it. We should not be throwing plastics into the ocean. We should not do all, the, all of these things because we're not going to water. Water is coming to us and we have to learn to live with it and deal with it. So it's not even a question, it's not an option. It's, not, it's just a, a problem that we all have to tackle together. Wonderful. It's so much more optimistic than um, uh, Jeff Goodell's uh, <laughs> proclamation at the end of his book. Uh, do I have time for another question, or is is are we? Yeah. Are we, I, I, so um, we are, of course, a school of architecture, and uh, you lecture, but you also teach at various schools of architecture around the world. But I'm curious um, how. Um, you mentioned earlier how in, in Africa you take the students to these various places and you can show them around. How do you get North American students to embrace the so-called minimum viable solutions and to get them to uh, engage in that really, you know, very basic kind of work when you're teaching? Yeah, it's a very great question because it's not one that I think cracks completely and in the sort of my pedagogy of, of teaching or of, you know, of uh, running these uh, uh, research studios that we do, I'm constantly also trying to improve that, which was where we developed the decima research um, methodology. Um, and the idea is that, I think one of the first thing is that we, you know, so, the students that I teach are students from North America that we take to the African continent. And these are students from, you know, the great institutions, you know, like yourselves and Harvard, Cornell, Columbia, Princeton, you know, name it, top great students with, with, with you know, access to, uh, I mean, they, their, their lives, most of them, many of them have never been to the continent. And one of the things I teach is that, look, we're going there, we're not making assumptions. We're not, we don't know anything. We should assume that you know, at best, we've done some desktop research and we might have actually been uh, bombarded with just fake news on the internet, but you've just done all of that work. And you should not make assumptions or have preconceptions until you meet people in those communities or in those cities and you meet the environment. So our visit is for us is, is about humility. You need to understand that you don't know everything and that you need to learn and hear people and meet people and make friends. And from that, you build relationships that would inform your way of thinking and understand their challenges and the opportunities. So that's what I fundamentally try to teach and try to educate uh, the team that I work with so that they also don't come with their idea, oh, I have this great, nice idea of a design and it should look like this and the form should be this. No, 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 it's not about that. What is it about? It's about people, demographics. It's about the economy. You know, how are people working? It's about the infrastructure that they have. It's about their social, political environments. Understand those things. Understand the resources that are available to them. And use design as a tool to orchestrate these complex things and produce a built a, a sort of a, a, a material form and material response. So. You know, it's not successful all the time, but it's, it's also a work in progress. Great, thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Kunle, for uh, participating. And um, we're sorry for the event during your um, uh, video, but we can assure you that that was not part of our uh, uh, academic community. It was somebody that hacked. Uh, this is open to everybody and it hacked uh, our, our system. Anyways, your message was very well taken. taken. Uh, we must learn to live with this problem of water and take the opportunity to innovate and use the vernacular to provide the DNA for the new city. Uh, thanks a lot. And yes, we yes. hope that you can come many times more. I hope so. I hope so. Thank yes. you so much. And thank you, thank uh, you. for the second glass. And uh, I wish everyone all the best. Thank you so much. Okay.